pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the November town board meeting in the town of Phillipstown. Um, what a day, huh? <laughs> Just couldn't get any better. Let's hope it continues. Um, glad to be living in this area right now. Uh, one thing just before we get going, obviously we just had a presidential election. I would remind everyone in town and wh whoever sees this that you know there's a process going on right now. Votes are being counted. Everybody needs to take a breath and rely on the strength of our democracy. So um, don't get crazy. <laughs> All right. Approval of minutes, monthly town board meeting, October 1st, 2020. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. I vote aye. Special meeting, October 20th, 2020. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Committee reports, conservation board. Okay. The conservation board met on October 13th. Our first, uh, we had a number of applications in there. The first one was 176. Moog Road, Garrison. Basically, this was to take a look at the uh, site plans, the Conservation Board, to take a look at it for the septic field, which was kind of tight regarding the site. Um, the Natural Resource Officer also discussed the uh, timber rattlesnake um, issues and also some trees that were cut down on the steep slopes. So that discussion went on regarding that. The next application was Riverview uh, Route 9. Uh, this was uh, regarding, um, this is an ongoing application uh, regarding a, a, a property across the street from the, the business. Um, the discussion, of course, um, has been ongoing in regards to the mitigation plans uh, regarding the uh, regulated wetland, uh, the actual uh, culvert uh, to Route 9, and they have identified a place for scrap parts in the, uh, far, in the front part. The applicant will uh, use asp uh, asphalt shavings and pervious, not paved service. Paving is very expensive. Um, they do re uh, ad advise the applicant that they would need a wetlands permit. Uh, the applicant has uh, in the past come forward with the fact that they would place a fence in the back to protect the wetlands, which is a very good idea. Um, the conservation board also asked for a three quarter inch barrier in the rear to avoid um, Actual shavings are run off into or regarding flash flooding problems. Um, the natural resource officer um, was concerned with the applicants to breach clean up as well, and that's ongoing. Yeah, how am I getting these all right? Uh, Hudson River Lane, uh, this is an ongoing discussion. Remember, we've been discussing it a number of times before uh, regarding um, the actual septic system that is going <coughs> before the Hudson River on the Hudson River. Obviously, anybody that's aware of it knows that you have to be very careful in regards to anything um, discharging that could possibly get in and affect the actual Hudson River itself. There was a long discussion with their engineer um, regarding many different uh, features of the peat uh, system. Uh, there were a lot of questions raised. Um, obviously, a number of uh, things. Uh, how high is it? Obviously, it's on the uh, least saturated location on the property. Um, there's also the properties zoned for AE zone flood level seven. Um, the actual proof system is nine and a half feet. Um, obviously, uh, the Board of Health requires that the system have a maintenance um, follow-up program and discussions were and accepted for annual uh, information to be submitted as well. Uh, there was concerns about what happens in power failures regarding no power and so forth, and uh, basically no power, no flow. So pretty much the uh, Conservation Board was very impressed with the uh, engineers' discussion in depth uh, regarding the system and all potential issues that could take place. Um, the natural resources are also uh, asked that the, uh, if the system should fail for any reason, that uh, the town be notified regarding that. And that's ongoing. Uh, regarding uh, 720 Route 301, this is a previous house that burnt down. Um, they're looking to erect a new structure there, uh, a 1,200-foot-square-foot, uh, two-bedroom, two-bath garage. 
The concerns for the Conservation Board beyond other boards' issues would be obviously the septic fields. Um, they're going to use the existing well and septic. Um, obviously, the Conservation Board, as they always try to do in any kind of applications, is to ask for the uh, house and so forth to be placed outside the buffer. But because of rock ledge areas on the property, uh, the same footprint is being asked for as well. The Conservation Board will perform a site visit. The next one involves uh, 342 Avery Road Garrison. This is inside the 100-foot buffer, of course, to the wetlands area. They're looking for a pool and decking. Uh, it's in the current lawn area. Uh, obviously, as usual with um, any kind of pools, the issue, of course, is the salt chlorine issues of possible contamination into the wetland areas. Uh, that was discussed as well that the, um, any potential would be extremely minimal and the 15-foot lawn area would clearly dissipate as well. Now the site, the Conservation Board has planned a site visit to go out there and take a look at it. They had a, a slight discussion regarding Desmond Fish Library. Um, they want to uh, basically install a discovery path um, and so forth. Uh, and the Conservation Board, after short discussion, agreed that they would go out and take a look at the site visit first. Roberto Muller and uh, Max Garfinkel, who is the Natural Resource Officer, and Roberto is the Climate Smart Coordinator, have been working for a number of months on uh, basically an inventory that would be capable of tracking the wetlands. Uh, this, is, uh, this was a lot of work uh, done by them and uh, something that uh, many of us that have been in uh, this program for a while have been looking forward to because it's very difficult um, when you first get an application. Uh, the applicant may not be aware of uh, any kind of wetlands or issues on the property. There is also uh, a potential for adjacent wetlands to also in, uh, be part of, be considered part of that system and affect that system. So by having this, it provides the ability to be able to track wetlands. And in our towns and our surveys that were performed recently, we have only 5% wetlands in our town, which is, in my opinion, low. So because of that, we really need to protect uh, what we, we have. Um, and obviously, uh, there was some discussions also regarding uh, stormwater issues. Um, obviously, we are in hurricane season still. We will be to the end of the month. While we have been personally spared a, great, uh, a, a lot, lot of storms, the rest of the country has not. This is, in a, this is a high uh, a hurricane year, uh, and we should always be prepared for that, and that's why we do take um, precautions regarding cleaning out storm drains, making sure that any of our roadways are in top shape. Um, if we do have flooding, obviously a hurricane, we, we can't possibly create a system to protect us for all of that. But if our existing systems are working, if our wetlands are protected and available to us, then they will mitigate a lot of min more minor storms and certainly reduce the damage that can happen from hurricanes. Um, so this is something important to remember as well. And our next meeting is November 10th. Thanks, Mike. Recreation. Good evening. The Recreation Commission met last Tuesday, October 27th, and reported that the drive-in at the Rec Center for Halloween was a great success, fully sold out, hocus pocus, was the movie and um, all of the children and the parents were delighted. They also held a trunk or treat with the Putnam County Youth Bureau and that too was a great success. They had over 50 organizations that and individuals who opened their car trunks had them filled with treats for kids and kids and their parents were able to drive through for trunk or treat. So that was a great success as well. The programming continues to be virtual and in person. The outdoor um, programs, full soccer and little kickers on the fields continue. Um, of course, the programs are at uh, limited capacity due to COVID continuing. The commission is working on updating its bylaws and we'll share them soon with the town board. And the Co Recreation Commission also elected a new chair, Bill Mazuka. The, um, the commission is continuing to work on preparing um, for future virtual programs and outdoor programs as well for the community. Thanks, Judy. Welcome. Phillips Town Hub. Phillips Town Hub had a hub hike 
for the first time on October 16th, led by Trailmaster Karen Kapoor, and that was a great success. The Hub is continuing to host community conversations and urges anyone in the Phillipstown community during this difficult time um, to contact the Hub for any mental health addiction resources that might be needed. The Phillipstown Hub can be reached at phillipstownhub.org or call 845-260-1001 or text that number if you need assistance. Thank you. Planning Board. Planning Board. I attended the Planning Board meeting October 15th. It was a very, very long meeting, and I'll give you a brief uh, addition of my report here because it was pretty long. It was two hours and 45 minutes. Anyway, first thing on the agenda was return of escrow of Claudia Moth, which that was approved under old business. Uh, Roland Heitman and Jean Marie Fleming, Angel Hill Road in Garrison, applicant to seek approval of site for new construction of a single family residence to serve by an on site uh, septic system and a, and a private well. There was a site visit on October 4th at 9 30. The new house will be less than 3,000 square feet. It's in a ridge line protected area and does have some steep slopes, uh, but there'll be no building in the steep slope area. The board classified as a minor project, listed as the type two action under SECA, referred to the conservation board, and uh, referred to the county, Putnam County Planning and Garrison Fire Department. No special permit will be required, and the board determined that there was no, no reason to have a public hearing. Uh, the prepared, probably will prepare approvals for next uh, meeting on, in November. Next time on the agenda was Tony and Kim Ricca, Ricky. This is their second time in front of the planning board. The applicant seeks to convert an existing second floor for room for storage into a two be uh, one bedroom apartment. This will be a zoning change and it was referred to the ZBA and we will require two variances. It's an illegal non-conforming lot. There's some concern about an existing mobile home that's on the lot already with the well and septic. Uh, the EAF assessment form has not been submitted yet. No site visits have been uh, scheduled because they're still through, not at that point at this particular time. We also had three public hearings this last month. Month, CSR Indus, uh, International Warehouse. I've been talking about this for quite some time. Is um, it's a warehouse office building they plan on building up on the Route 9, just north of the um, uh, Post Road Trailer Park. There, um, last month it, we there was really no public comment. But it was left open because the the planning board got the uh, traffic report at the last minute, so they didn't have time to review it. They did review the traffic report. They do, do, there are some concerns about the turning radius and amount of top stop time entering and leaving the, the site. Uh, but there's plenty of clearance on Route 9, according to the report. They only need like 555 feet. They have over 700 feet of uh, clear visibility. Uh, there was no public comment as I indicated. Uh, they also will be adding additional landscaping to the, to the south and west. So that should help some of the people's concerns around that live around that area. Uh, so, like I said, the public hearing was closed, and uh, probably next month they will talk about this and possibly give them their approvals. We'll have to see what happens. Also, Magazino, which has been on in the planning board for several months as well, they have two items on Florida planning board. One is a lot line adjustment, and the other one is for a new building they're looking to seek to build a three story, a two story building, like 31 or two feet high. Um, there was only one public person there, only one public comment, and that public that was in favor of it. There was no other public comments about it, so I think they're on the right road to get this probably approved in next in next month's uh, application. Next on the uh, public hearing was Andrew Coppler, 176 Moog Road, Garrison. The applicant is seek to approve an, an existing deck of construction in a three-season room in a formal courtyard. It's a 21-point-acre property. Uh, we did have a site visit as well. The concerns they have there, there was going to be some planting in the steep slopes, but they've d revised that, and you're not going to be planting anything in the steep slopes. That public hearing was closed as well. Under new business, Joseph Tell Lombardi, 19 Fieldstone Ridge Road, uh, Cold Spring, New York. The applicant seeks a, a subdivision, a sub approval to a, a, a lot line adjustment from the Leach, uh, his next door neighbor, Leach. And um, this is a non-conforming lot. This will be more conforming, but not 100% conforming. The board declared this in a minor subdivision. A type two seeker action was uh, listed, referred to the county, Putnam County Planning. No site was vi visit is required. 
Uh, Christopher Flagg and Heidi Schneider, 699 Albany Post Road, Garrison, New York. Applicant is seeking a barn-like addition to an existing of a family room and bedroom and bath, a garden and tool storage, and greenhouse connected to an existing four-bedroom house. The addition will be 1,762 square feet on two levels. Currently, it's with the ZBA. A special permit will be required. It's a non-conforming lot. It's considered a minor project, and a Type 2 act seeker action was listed, referred to the County Planning and the Board of Health and the Garrison Fire Department. The site visit is scheduled for November 15th, 9.30. Last on the agenda was 6, 3622 Route 9, Cold Spring, up on Route 9. The applicant is seeking a site plan approval to remove an existing 2,000-square-foot structure and a 325-foot structure and, and create a new building, two new buildings of 15,500 square feet and 10,500 square feet to house a contractor's office and yard. The board declared this is a major project and will be lead agency for under SICA. It, um, it was also required a new well and septic referred to the county planning and board of health, North Island's fire department and a site visit is for November 15th. The next planning board meeting is, I'm sorry, the next planning board meeting is November 15th. Uh, was adjourned at 9 15, 10 15. Thank you. Thanks, Pop. Zoning. I'm certainly happy I represent the zoning board, not the planning board. <laughs> so the ZBA met on October 19th for one public hearing for the Cummings property at South Mountain Pass Spur. They were seeking two variances for a lot line adjustment and lot size adjustment. The public hearing was held and passed unanimously. Next meeting is November 9th. That's my kind of report. <laughs> <laughs> I wish mine could be that way. <laughs> <laughs> highway. Highway. Phillipstown Town Board members, Carl Presenda. Work performed by the Phillipstown Highway Department for the month of October. Crews have been grading dirt roads and patching paved roads. We will continue to repair potholes on both roads, weather permitting. In anticipation of winter season, the Highway Department would like everyone to please consider the following. Have a safe place to park your car during winter storms, not on the town roads. Do not push or shovel snow back into the roadways, please, New York State law. Is your mailbox post sturdy enough to withstand snow coming off the plows? If the post is starting to rot, consider replacing it as already compromised posts are easily destroyed. Is your vehicle snow and ice friendly? Consider snow tires. Move all personal items away from the shoulders of the road. If you don't, our plows will. Make sure you have made arrangements for snow and ice control for your driveway or private road. If travel is not necessary, please stay off the roads. Please be considerate to the highway workers. These dedicated individuals work long nights and very early mornings to keep the roads as safe as possible. And most of all, please go slow and be patient. Along with our routine maintenance of the town roads, we have started blowing leaves. Leaves interfere with the grading of dirt roads and must be picked up before these roads are graded. We are asking residents to follow the town go code and do not blow leaves on a town road. Not only leaves cause hazardous situations for motorists, it also ca causes problems for drainage. The last road to be resurfaced for the year have been finished, Highland Drive and Ox Yoke, it's all done. The Avery Road Bridge Culvert Replacement Project was completed in a timely manner by Landworks Excavating Incorporated. They did a terrific job. The Highway Department received approximately 25 phone calls regarding road complaints and issues for the month of October. Roughly $8,626 was spent on vehicle maintenance and repairs for the month of October. The above report submitted by Carl Frizen, the highway superintendent. Thank you, John. I gotta say Landworks is a, just a great yeah. contracting firm where we've had nothing but positive experiences with Landworks. So. And a little bitter. Yeah, always a little bitter and come in and get the job done and always give you a little more. Yeah. So my hat's off to them. Well, as far as building and land acquisition, <laughs> Uh, as everyone knows, we're entertaining a new highway garage. We're going to move ahead with that. You'll see some uh, reference to that later on in the uh, fluids uh, system that we have to put in up there. With Town Hall, we are back on track uh, after about three months of not feeling like we were, but we had some real come-to-Jesus moments down there, and I think we're definitely back on track. We have a much clearer end. Uh, complete line of communication with our contractor now, and we have made ourselves available. We, both John and I were there today, but if he calls, we go, we make decisions right then. So the project is definitely back on track, and we were pleased to hear today that he feels like we'll be ready to move in by the first of the year. So 
hopefully we'll stay right on that. So the next month you're going to see a lot of activity, especially on the outside. The inside is looking really, really good, I have to say. I did reach out to the plumbing contractor today. Um, like I said, I probably will be off his Christmas card list, but, um, and I did not get a call back from the project manager, so I will be calling again tomorrow. Thank you. Cemetery committee. Okay, the cemetery committee met on October 15th. Again, we've been doing site visits, which have been very beneficial. Um, we have been working, anybody that's taking their kids to school in Haldane or in that area knows that we switched back to the Mountain Avenue Cemetery. We had to move to North Highlands in order to deal with some uh, structural issues. Um, the um, Stone Mason Taggart Lake was there with us, um, went around with the committee members, uh, showed the work that's currently going. Obviously some of the work, if you've been by there, know that we performed certain work, we had to stop and move to the other cemetery. Uh, there's a lot of underground work that exists with these, um, and I don't think probably most of us, I know I didn't when I first started this, didn't believe that there were such structures underneath. Um, it's, um, it's, it's amazing, you pick up something, a piece of a foundation, and you're basically able to crumble it in your hand, because it deteriorates over time. So um, that's another reason why we have, we have issues, because obviously these cemeteries so, you know, go back just about to the revolution. So. Um, we do have, or the 1800s, so we have uh, a lot of damage that way. Um, some, one, thing, one interesting thing, and of course every time you do something you find something different, was uh, for whatever reason someone took uh, part of someone's grave and used it for their a foundation on another um, grave, which of course you'd only find out when you dug it up because it collapsed. Um, the committee, uh, who does uh, very good research, was able to determine based upon the date and a little bit of information, uh, we're able to determine exactly who it was and so forth. Um, how we will exactly, we're obviously going to research and try to find the exact spot in the cemetery. Ho hopefully it is that cemetery. That doesn't always happen sometimes, as we discussed in the past. Um, and then we will try to take a look at some way of putting it back, maybe with a cement um, uh, surface around it and so forth so that it isn't, because it's a very small piece, it's not a large piece. Um, so that's an interesting uh, twist that happened there, but it was very interesting, it's very informative for the committee to see the work that goes on, what, what we have to do and so forth regarding uh, that work. Um, we also discussed, um, if you notice in Mountain Avenue Cemetery, there's a, in the front section, um, there's a, 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 a big open area on the mound. Um, the, the group was able to determine that there are, in fact, graves buried there, uh, and it's believed that the families did not have the money to put up the gravestones. So something that we are, would like to do in the future is to put up some sort of marker to dedicate to the people that are buried there that don't have an actual marker. Um, so um, obviously uh, we've been having to put off ground radar for mostly financial reasons. Um, and the other work really became a requirement, so that's what we did that uh, regarding that. Uh, and we will, um, in, the in the near future, also be able to hopefully uh, make some determinations exactly where we're going to be going next. Um, Funding-wise for next year, um, because our funding also takes care of paying the landscaper. And obviously, uh, I think, uh, at least I am extremely pleased with the landscaper and what they do. Uh, keep our, it's very important, in, in my opinion, to keep the graves um, neat and clean. We have so many veterans, uh, people that have that built this area. The history of it is is there. Those people built who we are today, and to let it overgrow and not take care of it is disgraceful, in my opinion. So, um, but we will have. So we'll have to. The town has been very generous with the monies, and thank you very much for the, for the amount of money. We do use it very uh, wisely, I believe, uh, but now we will have to pay, uh, use a, a good portion of it just for landscaping. Um, so we will not next year um, do the um, renovations that we once did, and, we, and ground radar is gonna be put off for a while simply because we just, you know, based on that money, can't do that, but uh, we, if people are interested, I know that it's on there to, to look for it, I would ask the board to consider um, advertising. We are, we're down to two members. I had 10 only a year or two ago. Um, I lost people for moving, for medical, for jobs change outs. Um, that becomes extre extremely difficult and restraining regarding research. Research is difficult and you can do it. People can join and just simply do it from their laptop. So I had one woman that couldn't physically do come in, stand and do stuff, but she was able to do the laptop and so forth. 
So we, we will accept, uh, you know, members who are restricted possibly and can't go out and so forth maybe. Uh, there are many ways you can serve on the committee. And I just encourage you to please, we obviously, uh, the site visits, we are COVID and we, we, stay, we, we space and so forth, so there's no danger that way. Um, and, I, and I would encourage you to please consider joining it or at least coming to one of our, our visits and uh, meetings and uh, judge for yourself and um, we welcome you at any time. Our next meeting is based, we like the site visits until the snow starts, so I don't have an actual date, but whatever date this, over this next month that looks like a little warmer, that's the one we'll do. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And maybe we can bump that up $1,000 in the budget. Thank you. Yeah, that would be good. All right, Putnam County Legislator. Hello, Nancy. <laughs> today. I just, you know, wanted to come by, say hi, uh, Putnam County Legislator Nancy Montgomery. Um, just to report, update, you're probably aware we did pass our $164 million 2021 budget, eight to one. I was the one no vote. I had some major concerns about the budget. As you may be aware, they cut the Marine Patrol Division for the Hudson River. Um, there have been other uh, major cuts in the Sheriff's Department. Um, there were no real increases in services um, and um, raises across the board, some very significant raises. I understand raises for contracted, those contracts that we have to uphold um, are necessary, but uh, there were some significant raises in, in the bottom line was major raises and no, no increase in services, actually a decrease in services. So. That's why I voted no. Um, and if you guys have any questions for me regarding that, I'm still fighting hard for the sheriffs. Last night, they um, voted to table transfer that's in his budget. We already approved it, but you know we have to approve it every time it moves. And they didn't move it out of his budget and it's back to the Protective Services Committee. So I encourage you to pay attention to the Protective Services Committee because public safety is at risk in Putnam County, um, especially in Phillipstown. So any questions for me, um, more than happy to answer them. You can contact me at 845-808-1020 or putcoledge at putnamcountyny.gov. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was really proud of the residents of Phillipstown for getting on the public hearing and yeah. making their voices heard. Yeah, I want to thank you all for uh, you know your concern about what's happening over there. And we're proud of you for fighting for Thank exactly. you. <laughs> End endlessly I'll, fighting. I'll fight harder. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Moving along. Oh, you did this? Or you could do a duet. We could. <laughs> the first item on the agenda is a resolution approving the return of escrow for Harini, Chundu, and Andrew Moth. 120 Skyline Drive, tax map 16123.13. All right, this has obviously gone before the uh, planning board and has their approval, so if I could get a motion on that resolution. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I vote aye. The next item is a resolution approving the Garrison Volunteer Ambulance Corps 2018 sponsor approval form for the Length of Service Award program. It's something we do every year for the LOSAP, uh, Length of Service Award Program for the Volunteers and Ambulance Corps. Um, so I don't, I don't see the list either. I think this is just right. No, I thought it, the list isn't there. Who made it? Well, it's been verified wherever that list is, been verified by the company president, the secretary, and the chief. It's got to be posted for 30 days. Yep. Um, the ambulance corps secretary's got some signature there. Who, who is that? <laughs> we know it's not John Hancock. <laughs> That's one thing we do know. Um, is the board comfortable moving ahead with this? I am too. Um, so can I get a motion uh, approving the Garrison Volunteer Ambulance Corps uh, low sap? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. I vote aye. 
That's the 2018. Mm -hmm. yeah. Run a little behind here. Yeah. Girl at Penflex, and I'm sh sh there's another one from 2019 that she's waiting on also, but I still haven't received the information from um, Chris Tobin at the cool. ambulance court. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is GVAC. They're, they'll be up to date after that one's passed. All right. Next is a resolution accepting the revised proposal form from E and FS LLC for pneumatic fluids and compressed air system in the amount of $6,500 for the new highway garage and authorizing Supervisor Shea to sign said proposal documents. So as I mentioned earlier, this is in reference to the new highway garage. This is for the design of the system. This is not the system itself. Um, so for the fluids that the trucks use and the pneumatic compressor system that they need to use to run the tools in the garage, the new garage. Um, this seems completely in line with what we we're seeing for design costs, so I'm comfortable moving ahead with it. Can I get a motion on the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next is a resolution authorizing town clerk to advertise for members for the cemetery committee. Um, yeah, as Mike mentioned earlier, we could use some members for the cemetery committee. It really is an interesting uh, job to get involved in. And I did see the guys out there working today. So we do appreciate all the work that Mike does on this. It is important to respect our debt, especially the military debt. And these cemeteries are filled with military debt. So. Um, that was another blow from the county, along with giving themselves raises that they cut the funding for cemeteries. And it was barely anything to begin with. We're talking yeah, about $3,400. $3, but they were able to increase some people's salaries over 10%. I know that. Um, so it's, that's pretty horrible in a time like this. But I guess they're happy with themselves. <laughs> And they do it at the very end of a meeting as the last thing. It's embarrassing to watch. It really is. You got to listen. Exactly. You can't watch and you can't comment. So how they do it, I don't know. And they bury it somewhere in that budget because <laughs> you can't, you don't know whose salary is what because now the salaries are private information somehow, even though it's taxpayer money. It is, it boggles the mind, <laughs> but at any rate, could I get a motion on that resolution for the cemetery committee before I wander too far? So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. And thank you, Mike, for all the work you do on that. Next is a resolution authorizing Supervisor Shea to sign the filming permit for John Perez Locations, Inc. for the Spariva project event to take place 10-7 to, that's supposed to say 10-8, 2020 at Indian Brook Falls, Indian Brook Falls Trail and Little Stony Point Beach. And this is Nug Proton. Okay. Um, just another film permit. So if I, if I could get a motion on that resolution. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. And I vote aye. Terry, do you want to? Do that other film permit now, or are we just gonna I wait? mean, I can, because they come in so like quickly, and they're usually looking for it in a few weeks. I don't know if, if, it's, if it's even been issued. Was it issued today, do you know? Uh, the check was received, you got a receipt, but I don't think Anne uh, We could okay. wait and do it I was gonna say, we can do it All right, All right, fine. Meeting. Yep. All right. Uh, sorry. Next is a resolution authorizing Supervisor Shea to sign the filming permit for John Perez Locations, Inc. for the Art World Project, event to take place 10-23-2020 at 40 High Ridge Road Garrison. And again, this is Nug Protonk. All right, already been done. Could I get a motion on that resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Next up is Garrison Properties and the Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. Theater. What theater? Well, we can't without Claudio. Claudio's not here. Yep. I think so, yeah. We don't have a board for that. Yeah, no, we have to have, yeah. We could do it during the week, take two minutes. No, that's all right. <laughs> so next up is Garrison Properties and Hudson Valley Shakespeare. Um, they're going to do a presentation regarding the movement of Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival to the Garrison Hello, Glenn. Club. All right, Glenn Watson. Good evening, all of you. Um, 
we're, I'm about to introduce you to some people who, 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 some of whom you know, some of whom you don't know, that's going to present to you what I think is going to be the most exciting project we've had in town. It's just an overwhelming uh, idea and, and thought, and I, I will make it brief. And um, but we're looking for we're looking to move it forward and. Uh, I won't tell you anything about it, but I'll let them tell you because I think they're a much better storyteller. So we have <clears throat> our property owner, Chris Davis, who is back somewhere, Chris Davis, and uh, David McCallum, who is the artistic director for the Shakespeare Festival, Katie Lieberman, who is the uh, managing director, which I finally got that right. She's back there. Um, we have Dan Hollis, his attorney from Mount Kisco, who's uh, helping us with the work. Chip Alleman, I guess everybody know, in town knows Chip. Where is it? Chip? There he is. Uh, and from the landscape architect firm the work that's working on the project, we have uh, Lainey McKinnon and Leslie Perez. Um, Lainey will be the one to tell you the whole story. Uh, in the background, and I hope listening tonight, are our traffic engineer, John Canning, and um, our environmental engineer, uh, our environmental um, planner, uh, Jan Johannesson, from uh, Kimley Horn and Kellard Sessions, uh, respectively. So with that, I'm going to ask Davis to come up and give you, a, a, tell you a little bit about what they're planning and... But we'll straighten it out, but we'll don't worry. <laughs> Hey everyone, I, I know, I, I, I haven't come here before because uh, although I know uh, many of you and I'm proud to be here, I feel I've gotten to hide behind Chip Alleman for so many years because he does such an incredible job here. And, but he said, given the scope and the scale and the sort of excitement of this project, he wanted me to at least introduce it to you by giving you a little bit of background, um, a little bit about how I got uh, involved in the uh, garrison properties to begin with, and then how this project sort of represents the, the culmination uh, of what started 21 years ago. So, you know, I actually moved up here 25 years ago and uh, bought the house that was the, uh, belonged to the uh, grandfather of a girl I grew up with. And so my entire time here for 25 years, it's been called the old foster place. And uh, I think that's the way it works. But but very quickly, uh, getting to know our neighbors and something I realized, and I think it's no news to the people on this board or the people here, but this place is a very rare place. Uh, it's rare because of exactly how you started the meeting with a reminder about decency, a reminder about disagreeing without being disagreeable, about knowing your neighbors. Uh, somehow this bubble has escaped the suburban sprawl and the vitriol and all sorts of other things that uh, plague the world, and they plagued the world 25 years ago, and maybe more so now. And so I, with the fervor of the converted, uh, I said I wanted to do you know, anything I could in my way to uh, continue uh, uh, to do what I could to protect or preserve, but also celebrate this peculiar culture and this peculiar place. And, and uh, so I was involved for many years, you know, at the Land Trust, and and um, which was sort of charged with a mission about preserving the character of the place, not just landscape or something like that. But I think the biggest uh, commitment to this was uh, when the Japanese insurance company that owned this uh, uh, property right in the center uh, of, of the community and a property where many people in the community had gotten married there or their kids had worked there or had been a country club in the 50s and 60s after Bill Brown's, uh, you know, they sort of fell on hard times. They sold it to the Japanese, uh, who I think in many ways were determined to extricate it from the community and make it private. And then as everything unwound uh, in the Japanese bubble, they became distressed sellers. And uh, what had happened uh, was very immediately, uh, there were about 10 terrifying schemes that came up, developers that really wanted to create sort of the worst of suburban sprawl on that property, people that talked about just putting a few huge mansions and taking it out of the community. And so I, I sort of saw an opportunity to maybe restore it to, to what it was uh, and turn it back into a community resource. And uh, I'm an investor, 
And I knew going in this would be a terrible investment uh, <laughs> because it, it really wasn't, there was no financial end game. The goal was to try to create a business that could be self-sustaining, you know, a functional nonprofit, all the profits go back into the business, um, and that would, but would be a, a resource in the community. And, you know, bringing Chip in to lead that was one of the best decisions ever made. He was completely true to that ethos, and I think he's woven the place into the fabric of the community with people's kids working there and, you know, people being a big employer, but also just being part of the place. And, uh, and so I guess, you know, with everything going on in the world and COVID, uh, you start thinking about mortality. And of course, one of the things that I worried about is, you know, the families that started this to begin with never thought it would end up in the hands of a Japanese insurance company. And uh, so I started thinking that I needed a permanent solution of how this could go on. And that was in the back of my mind when something was happening in a very similar vein across town. And so here, you know, we have all these incredible ornaments, you know, Manitoga and Bosque Bell and Constitution Marsh and Dockside and, you know, uh, Breakneck. I mean, this incredible abundance of resources in this community. But without question, Hudson Valley Shakespeare is just a jewel in the crown. It's an incredible thing to have people all over the country talk about this theater festival as being world class. And here it is sitting right in the middle of the Hudson Highlands. And with Davis and Katie as sort of a new team of leadership with ambitions and wanting to uh, really put down roots, here they were coming to the end of their lease. And it became clear that Boscobel could not be their permanent home. So it makes sense. They want to put down roots. They want to have a permanent home and build on the foundation that they've had for 30 years uh, running it. And uh, I got wind of this idea that they were looking outside of our community, uh, that they could be looking further north or further south, uh, that they wanted a place that was beautiful and could be iconic, but where they could invest and build a future. And so they needed a permanent home. I needed a permanent solution. It was just this incredible confluence. And so we started talking about what it means to the sustainability of the business to have 30,000 people coming and having meals and being on the campus, how it integrates completely with the long-term vision about uh, uh, this being a community resource and part of what we do. And, uh, and we have a dream management team in, in uh, Davis and Katie to do it. And I think what's so dramatic about it is, you know, unlike all of these developments I think about over the land trust over the years and, you know, the fears of people coming from out of town and wanting to scar the place and then get out of Dodge. You know, here we had two organizations with really deeply part of the fabric and deep roots in the community uh, with a vision about what they want to do and more importantly, with an incredible investment behind it. I mean, to have Davis and Katie be able to raise the funds to bring a project together and not just the funds, but a, an absolute world-class team. I'm on the board of the Museum of Natural History and we've been doing an addition and, and we were gloating about landing one of the great architects on earth to do that addition. And here Davis and Katie have her designing a tent here in Garrison. So it's an incredible world-class team, an incredible investment and an opportunity I think we'll look back on. So I'm delighted to be gifting them the land to get started, but with the view of this really being an arts campus that continues to have all of the meals and the celebrations and the parties and weddings and all sorts of things that have been part of what's made it an institution. So with that, I get to introduce, I think, Davis, uh, who, of course, I love his name and uh, <laughs> wish he was a relative, but, but Davis is, it was Davis's vision and ambition that he brought to his board that really launched the entire project. So, Davis. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Supervisor Shea, members of the board, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, my name is Davis McCallum. I'm the artistic director at the Shakespeare Festival, and I lead the theater alongside Katie Liberman, our managing director. We are enormously grateful to Chris Davis for choosing a local arts organization as the next steward for this important piece of land. I also wanna thank Chip Alleman and his team at the Garrison for their partnership as we bring together these two Phillipstown institutions. 
As many of you will know, Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival does have deep roots in this community. As Chris mentioned, we were founded back in 1987 with an outdoor production of A Midsummer Night's Dream at Manitoba. And the following year, Bosque Bell House and Gardens agreed to host our performances on their grounds, and we've been a seasonal tenant there ever since. Over the intervening 33 years, we've become an important part of the cultural life of the Hudson Valley. Our summer season now consists of three or four plays presented in rotating repertory under a custom-designed open-air theater tent with seating for 530. We've built a loyal and enthusiastic audience. In fact, some folks who first came as kids are now bringing their kids to see shows under the tent. And additionally, and fewer people know about this, our, our year-round education programs enjoy robust partnerships with all of the local schools, and our teaching artists reach over 35,000 kids and educators every year. In recent years, we've deepened our connection with the local community by commissioning and producing works that celebrate the people, history, and culture of the Hudson Valley, including uh, The General from America, which told the story of Benedict Arnold and his escape from the Beverly Robinson House, which you could probably hit with a baseball from the parking lot. Our year-round staff of eight all live in this community. Katie is the former president of the Cold Spring Chamber of Commerce. Sean McNall, our director of education, sits on the Haldane School Board. And at the height of our summer season, we employ over 200 people on stage, off stage, front of house, in the administrative office. For many young people in the community, as Chris mentioned at the garrison, uh, a summer job at Shakespeare working in the concession stand has become a rite of passage. Chris's visionary generosity allows HVSF a singular opportunity to transform from being seasonal tenants in this community to building a permanent home here. Our goal will be to extend our record of civic engagement to become a year-round cultural anchor and recreational resource while developing community-rich stewardship of this important landscape in a way that is both financially and environmentally sustainable. I wanna thank you again for your time and attention, and I'm now gonna turn it over to Lainey McKinnon from Nelson Bird Woltz to share some more details of our plans for our new home. Thank you. Thank you. One second, I'm gonna turn on our computer here so we can see. Warming up back there. <clears throat> there you go. John, do you know how to, I mean, can we turn off half the lights or something? Okay. Okay. Hi, thank you for the time. My name is Lainey McKinnon. Um, I work at Nelson Bird Woltz, Landscape Architects, and we're working with the great team that you've met most of now to help envision the future for Hudson Valley Shakespeare and the garrison as part of the community. So this is a, a new photo we just got the other day of a, a fundraising event on the site, and it's really inspirational to kind of kick it off that way with the beautiful view um, that the site affords. So I just want to orient everybody for a moment, you see the site here on the screen. Um, one of the, the ways we're working on this project, as we know, it's an 18 hole golf course. Right now, the, the first move is to make it a nine hole golf course that takes up the western side of the property, a, a residence, the, the Hudson Valley Shakespeare taking up the central portion, and then what we're calling the challenge parcel on Route 9. So we'll walk through all of this, but I just wanted to orient everybody um, with Route 9 here. Along the eastern side, this is Snake Hill Road and Phillips Brook along the top. So we have a great opportunity and a great challenge in front of us to be able to intertwine the beautiful landscape of this area with the theatrical productions based in Shakespeare and in the, in the, the expansion of that through the community, using those as our twin inspirations, linking those together. 
and then bringing all of that to the community so we can share in our humanity. And that really seems to be our opportunity on this site. So this is, we're at the master planning stage right now. So we're beginning to look at where things could situate on the site and we'll walk through each of them. We have a long range concept plan and then we have two phases that we plan on working in. So we'll start with the first phase. One of the first things we've done is to look at the buildings that are already on the site and understanding what stays, what gets just changed a little bit, maybe it's interior program, and what elements need to be either removed or replaced to a different area. So you'll notice, for an example, the cart barn, we're gonna take it down from where it is now, but move it to another location. So utilizing the resources that we have available already on the site, repurposing those as much as possible. Okay, our phase one. I'll walk everybody through this. If there are any questions while I'm talking, please stop me, because I know it's, um, it's small from where you are. So this is the existing entrance of Snake Hill Road. This is the existing entrance off of Route 9. We're keeping both of those for the first phase of work. And I'll walk you through the project. Let's start um, as if you're coming in off of Snake Hill Road on the south, just so we're all on the same page. If you're coming in that area, that, oops, too sensitive. You're coming in from the south, you come up the road. There's, the first thing you see is a new rehearsal area. This is the existing cottage that's on site. We're planning for parking for the theater here. And then up at the top, speaking of the theater, is our new tent. This takes advantage of the view that we saw on the very first slide. It's integrated with the landscape. It's becoming, we're working on how to grade that and situate it so that it becomes, we'll have a section later, but it, it becomes somewhere to go to, but it's not overimposing um, on the land. We have th a series of, this is the, a new back of house structure for actors. We have a concessions and restrooms at the top so that they really have the same functionality as now, but in an increased viability. There's three picnic lawns to maintain that tradition of picnicking before you go to the show. And, and with this new site, we have an opportunity to potentially expand the duration of having that beautiful picnic and expand the, the season a little bit longer than, than it is right now. Um, oops, I'm very sensitive on this mouse night. There's a, we keep the existing parking that's already there. We keep all of the new buildings. And then in the place of where the um, pro shop is now, what we're proposing is an outdoor pavilion. This would be able to host students coming to the site because as Davis mentioned, right now everybody goes out into the community. So now the community, the students could come to the site and be able to engage with the theater and the landscape together. Um, so this is our first phase. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I missed two little pieces down here. A small box office and picnic pickup when you're coming in from the parking. And we just wanted to show you a few precedent images of what, since we're in master planning, nothing has been specifically designed. So we wanted to show some precedent images of where we believe we'll be going and how the look and the feel of the site will, will come together. These are some precedent images of the welcome house, the box office, a picnic pickup. Some examples of potential paths that could lead you up to the site with some being uh, a hardscape for accessibility, some being mown paths through meadows. They have a variety of experiences to get to the tent. Some precedents for the rehearsal space, very simple of the community. They don't, they're not imposing and at the bottom, you can see some precedent images of the pavilion, outdoor pavilion. So that's our kind of first very large uh, piece of work. And then for the future campus, and this is a very long-term vision, but we're showing where we want to go and our aspirations for the site over a long course of years. So in addition to all we've talked about, the second phase of work, would have a year-round indoor theater. So it really begins to have, expand the season for Hudson Valley Shakespeare so that you can have plays in the winter and provide a contrast to the outdoor experience. It would be, yes? So that, that is the existing tent. 
It's the, it would be a new tent. But similar size. It would be the same, it'd be a similar size. Seating capacity would be the same. We're not looking to expand. The scale is yes, <coughs> so it's relatively speaking, similar size. Um, in the second phase, so we have our indoor theater. One of the big moves we're studying and proposing is that in this one, the Route 9 entrance stay the same, but we actually open up the entire side of this area by swinging the road further out and creating an interior parkland that's open to the community with walking trails, with natural ecology systems in place for potential um, growth of like a science program with students coming to the, or coming to see something on the weekend that's blooming in season. So providing a public park basically at, at that edge. Part of this second phase, we're also proposing um, guest accommodations it, uh, in two pieces, a 20, excuse me, a 20 room area here and then small cabins around this area that take advantage of an existing road that's already there. Um, there also be a series of trails that run through the woodland that we would be able to mark out and join into some of the other surrounding areas such as the North Redoubt Trail or not quite connect to the Appalachian Trail but allow for some connection into the broader community and the hiking system here. So in our studies, we're looking at a section through um, kind of the primary part of the tent and looking You'll see here on the far right hand side oh, of the image is Route 9. So you can get a feel for how far away and how small the tent actually feels when you're driving down the road. We've nestled it in so that it feels appropriately sighted and not a, too much of a glaring beacon. You want it to be to pull you in without feeling like it's taking over. Um, I'm just walking through. So that, as I said, this is the road. This is your open parkland. This is the existing water system here, um, the wetland. And then you have parking. You can see kind of in the background of, of massing of the second tent, I mean, excuse me, the second theater, the box office in the foreground, and then this beautiful procession up the hillside to get to your tent that looks out at the view. A few more precedents to inspire us a little bit more tonight. The top two images are precedents for the year-round theater. The bottom two for the look and feel of the guest cottages that I mentioned kind of along the, the northeastern path. So really nestling them into the site so they feel like they've been there for a while. Of the permanent indoor, is there any thoughts on that? Yes, I'm going to rely on Davis and Katie to help me with that. 225. That was, uh, that was my memory, but I didn't want to say it wrong. 225. And the tent is currently 500. 530. Mm -hmm. And then we just wanted to leave with some images of the presence of the woodland pass that I mentioned and just that very different intimate experience you can have on the site um, on that north side with such beautiful coverage. And actually, we found very healthy ecosystem with a little bit of love. So we could really make that, that beautiful. And then I'll, I'll leave it here with um, kind of our final concept plan. And if there are any questions, How many we're happy. To... Spaces are you so we, um, we'll, we're working through that right now and we're gonna phase them in over time. The first lot here, the, the, new, the primary new one yeah. is a little over 200. And then the existing lot, so you know, is 88. So there's that. And you know what I forgot to mention? Chip, is the relocation of our golf area. <laughs> okay. um, so the new pro shop and cart barn would actually be here in an already existing kind of gravel area that is used for overflow parking and actually storage of the Hudson Valley Shakespeare tent. So it's an already disturbed area that actually would get uh, some That's nice down. treatment. Yes, yeah. yes. There's already an existing entrance to it you know, we're not creating a new road, new cut through over the aqueduct. So we're taking advantage of some existing conditions. And that, so that in that area, we're estimating, the, I think we have 50 to 60 parking spaces planned for down there in the first phase. 
And then as we grow over time, we'd be able to add in additional parking spaces. Um, I think I didn't point that out, but there's another lot here that we haven't sized exactly, but would have approximately, let me go back, probably 75 spaces. So basically, if you're going to play golf, you would go in off of Snake Hill Road at this point. Yes, in golf would enter, as you said, off over here on the western side. And then the rest of the campus, you could enter from Snake Hill or from Route 9. So we're not changing those entrance patterns. Is there any plans to expand the uh, current uh, catering facility you have there today? So, the, expanding the catering facility? The plan, the plan right now is that the catering facility will stay as it is operating as it is. Uh -huh. And just benefit from the additional audiences of Shakespeare and the education programs to use during the week, which right now are our active spaces are underutilized during the week, of course. Uh, so we see it as a really good fit. We were, we've been talking a, a bit about envisioning how you could bring your picnic, right? A lot of people bring their picnic to Baskerville. You could pick something up that's been made for you at the restaurant, at the picnic pickup, or if, you're, if you don't want to have a picnic that week, maybe you go and have, you, have dinner at the restaurant and you walk up. So it really provides a variety of experiences and ways to enjoy the culinary wonders of the, the Valley Restaurant and then also expand that, that offering to the, the theater going community. Will they still have weddings there? Could people still have a wedding there? Absolutely, definitely. Um, that stays, we love it. We think it's a really great aspect to the site. And that was part of the, I think in the, one of the first slides, I should have mentioned that, but that's in the retain. <laughs> that's the don't change part. And then would hope be that if you're having weddings, once you hit this uh, concept plan in the future, that maybe some of the accommodations would be for people at the weddings yes and we've talked extensively about what size you need in order to host a wedding group and so chip's been a really a good guide in that saying that you, you can't host the whole wedding at, on this site but 20 so we want to have a block of 20 rooms all together which you if you remember i mentioned a 20 room accommodation that is specifically with that in mind and then the cabins yes and so that could be um, artist housing, you know, that we could, instead of, right now we rent, the Hudson Valley Shakespeare rents in the community and so they could recoup that or it could be for a guest who's in the area. And Chip, or maybe you know, the, um, the approval for the last master plan, how many rooms were anticipated in that master plan? 40. 40, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Huh. Great. Thank you. So even if there were a wedding going on and a performance, there'd still be enough parking for everybody to be yes. on campus without any confusion to the roads or. Yes, and that's part of the keeping the two entrances, having multiple parking areas is that there are options when you come in, you can be guided to where you need to go. And as Chip has said, that a lot of the weddings come by bus. So you don't have as many cars as you might envision because you have two buses, maybe they set off to the side. And it's not 100 cars. Parking's a big issue here at the moment. I know. <laughs> it's a big issue everywhere. <laughs> well, luckily, it's out of the village <laughs> because that's... <laughs> that, but And it's off the road, and it has access to a state highway and... You know, it already has multiple entrances, so it, it does seem like a, an easier lift than if it were in another location. It's also incredibly exciting to see, you know, the synergy between all these different activities and being able to keep Shakespeare in town. That, you know, to me, that's an incredible opportunity and a positive because if Shakespeare left town, that would, you know, we'd be so much less for it. Um, it really has become a community institution, so 
that spot with that view is going to be absolutely spectacular. Yeah. It's unreal. I mean, to bring people to that spot, yeah, again, to see Shakespeare, to experience the site, to just experience all that we have to offer here, and to have the space to do it, too. I mean, it's, it's a large, you know, it's a large site for this town. So, and also, you know, the, the fact that it feels like it's very little impact, you know, we're not looking at, Again, in the past, this could have been a development, this could have been any number of things. So um, it really, it, I just see it as a, a real addition to the community. Okay, anything else that I can help with before I turn it over to our last guest speaker? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, all. I think, uh, I might have to adjust this. There, how's that? My, as uh, Laney said and as Glenn said, my name is P. Daniel Hollis. I'm a senior partner at Hollis Laidlaw and Simon in Mount Kisco, New York, and we're the attorneys for the project. I feel very privileged to be part of this type of a project. Uh, it's very exciting for the community. It's very exciting intellectually, artistically, on any number of levels. However, I'm here to talk about the drier part of the the application, the process. And um, not, the process that I'm, I'm here to talk to you about tonight is what I hope you will consider doing tonight, which is to accept our petition. That's the first step when a petition for a text amendment is presented to a town board. It's a legislative act. The town board can accept it or reject it at any time. But if you accept it, which I hope you do, it's not a guarantee of an approval it's certainly not a final approval, but it just allows the process to go forward. So step one, accept the petition. Step two, related to that, is to refer the matter to the planning board for a report and recommendation as to their view of what this project will be as an impact on the community. And it's my understanding that historically your board uh, uh, gives the planning board the secret lead agency status. So that would be part of the referral that they would be the lead agency under SECRA, State Environmental Quality Review Act, and they would take care of the environmental review as part of their process. There are three approvals that are required from the planning board. Subdivision of the property, because the whole property in the plan development uh, district is uh, now a larger parcel, but we're gonna be carving out the parts that Laney showed you. Subdivision, site plan approval, and special permit. There's a lot of review that's going to go on for this project. Your board, the planning board, the conservation board for a wetland permit, Put Putnam County, Department of Health for septic, highway department for high work permits, and the county planning department for a referral to them for their determination as to whether this approval is one for local determination or one that has to be in their purview under section 239 M and N of the uh, town law. New York State Department, uh, of, uh, New York City Department of Environmental Protection is involved because we're crossing the aqueduct. The New York State Department of Transportation is involved because of a highway permit. New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is involved for a speedies uh, permit, general permit for stormwater. So there's a, many levels of review and it's a, it's a long road, but we're willing and able and hoping to work in a collaborative fashion with your board and the planning board. We stand ready, if it's your board's uh, wish and that of the planning board, to have joint work sessions so we can fine tune this project. We wanna approach this in a collaborative way so that the community will be blessed by what we hope to bring to it and have a lot of input in how we come to the conclusion at the end of the, the process. So what I would like to have you do tonight, if that's possible, is to accept the petition, uh, refer the matter to the planning board for report and recommendation, and ask them to consider being lead agency under SECRA. We made a contemporaneous application to them, and we're on their agenda for the 19th of this month, so that, that we can launch the SECRA process there, if, the, if it's their wish, after your direction that they assume that role, they will circulate their notice of intent to be lead agency. 
There's a 30-day clock on that, as you probably all know. And after that 30-day clock is up, then we can start to do the deep dive into the entirety of the project. So it's a very exciting project. There's many, many uh, things that we all need to talk about. We're aware of them. Our team is experienced. We're addressing them. And we'll be prepared at each and every meeting to have the answers that we hope will give you the uh, comfort to give us an approval at the end of the day for the text amendments we need to get to where we want to be. So if there are any questions of myself or any of the other team members, otherwise I'll thank you, ask that you make, uh, accept the petition, make that referral, and then say good night. Curiosity, do you think we'd be ready in 2022 to have Shakespeare at this location? That's the hope, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would say is this evening, you know, in deference to the planning board and the chair, we would want to consult with them and the town attorney before accepting anything because I, I, I want to get off on the right foot. <laughs> and I want to make sure everybody feels included in the process. So I think rather than running the risk of um, people feeling left out, I think we're better off consulting and then as early as next Wednesday, accepting the petition. Okay. So I, it's my opinion that that would be a smoother way to go. Whatever you say, sir. All right, thank you. And uh, we're, would you require our appearances next Wednesday? No, I don't okay. think so. Okay. I think that we would just, I think as a, uh, you know, sort of a pro forma that evening, we could go ahead and accept it, but I would like to just confer with everyone and make sure there's a level of comfort. Certainly, I understood. But that, did I make myself clear on the steps that we need to take? Yes, and, absolutely. Okay. You know, I, I would say it's, you know, it's not our first rodeo, so. No, of course not, no. <laughs> um, and we have done planned development districts before. Um, and I think that, as you said, the more open the process is, the more everyone understands it, the uh, better the outcome and also the smoother the process. So, and one thing that we as a board really um, like to see is time well used. So we don't like, we know that there's money involved in any, everyone showing up. We want to make sure that that time is, is well used and we want to make sure that when the clock's running that we're getting something done. Yeah. So, um, and I think that again, the best way to make sure that happens is to confer with everyone. Next Wednesday, we, you know, we'll accept the petition. I fully anticipate. And then we go from there. That'd be great. And that way we can stay on the, the agenda for the 19th with the planning board. Exactly, yes. Perfect. That's, that's absolutely fine. I understand that completely. Yes. And we'll always be prepared, believe me. We, this team is, prides itself on being prepared so that we can anticipate things uh, at meetings as they're coming up so that we don't have to take two weeks or a month to get back to you. We, we'll try to be as proactive as we can and, and responsive as well. And I, I also think it's, you know, there'll be a, a, a high level of comfort since these are all community members. We know everyone here. Um, again, Hudson Valley Shakespeare, just a, a real bedrock of the community and a community institution. So um, we certainly do want to see them succeed and we do want them to stay local. Well, so. We appreciate that. Yes. Anything else? Uh, anything? I just point out next Wednesday is Veterans Day, but yeah. I don't know if that makes a difference to us. Uh, meeting. Well, I mean, we could do it during the day on Thursday. You know, we could have a special town board meeting at Town Hall on Thursday. Also, I don't know if you recall last month, you, you decided you could meet every Tuesday if at, necessary, at town hall. Tuesday morning. So, yeah. I don't know. so we'll, we'll, let's, let's tentatively schedule for Tuesday now. Yeah. Because we've already arranged to have meetings, standing meetings on Tuesday during the day. And is the idea of joint meeting with the planning board, is that something you'll talk about with them too, Supervisor? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. So then we'll plan on being together Tuesday, at least the majority of the board to accept the petition next Tuesday, but that gives a little time to speak with all the players in this. All right. So next on the agenda is to schedule any workshops or meetings. We have the next monthly town board meeting for December 3rd. Um, we have a workshop with Hudson Valley Community Power CCA. It's the annual update 
Um, the tentative date would be November 18th. It's a Wednesday. That's fine. Okay. That would be at 7.30 here. Wasn't that at Dolly's last time? Yeah. I thought, yeah. Yeah, why can't we have it down there again? It was much more enjoyable. <laughs> Um, and the last meeting would be to schedule the adoption of the 2021 budget. Um, the tentative date is also, would also be the 18th. I mean, is that okay with you doing it the yeah, same night? I, okay. Yeah, I mean, the budget adoption, I don't anticipate yeah. that being a long process. We've been through the whole process already. We were here last night and we had the public hearing for the budget last night to an empty room. <laughs> so that was, uh, I guess currently that's not all that surprising. People are probably pretty weary. So again, we'll meet next Tuesday. Do we want to set a time right now? Well, the, the, the time is 9 a.m. is what we... So Tuesday at 9 a.m. we'll yeah. be down at Town Hall. So advance warning, everyone. Okay. We're going to see a lot of each other. <laughs> <laughs> next on the agenda is the Code Enforcement Monthly Report for October. Amount of fees collected was $101,508.47. There were 51 permits issued, eight additions, alterations, or repairs to residential buildings, uh, 43 all other per permits, uh, pools, decks, sheds, plumbing, HVAC, et cetera. Uh, 24 certificates of occupancy, one stop work order, three inspections of public assembly, two inspections of commercial occupancies and projects of significance. The building inspector would like everyone to take time to service their heating device and smoke detectors and CO detectors. All right, our thanks to Greg. <clears throat> Is that a record for us uh, in a month? It might be. Has to be. It might be. I've never seen over $100,000 collected. It shows the level of activity in town right now. Oh, good for the building department. <laughs> um, anything else from the board? Uh, just one thing I want to bring up. There has been a blood drive in town in quite some time since COVID started. If there is going to be one this uh, went next Wednesday, 11-11, at Our Lady of Loretto. I encourage anyone who can give blood, please do so. Right. Yeah, thank you. Happy Veterans Day next week, too. That's right. All the That's veterans. Anything from the audience? Yes, Nat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, Greg McGarva, uh, just a quick follow-up um, uh, regarding two things um, from our meeting last week, or last month rather, on, uh, uh, we submitted, uh, the residents of Indian Brook submitted a signage uh, recommendation packet uh, to Tara or via Tara. And I'm just wondering what's the, what's the best way for us to follow up on what, what, you know, in terms of what our expectations should be vis-a-vis uh, uh, what are the recommendations you all feel are uh, merit meritable and how they would uh, how and when they might get put in i really it's it's only been four weeks i get that and i'm not looking for action i'm just kind of looking for how we might follow up on it properly well i would say um one thing once we get through adopting the budgets we've been pretty bu busy with that so obviously we uh, haven't been able to get on that but um we do realize that the signage recommendation, the packet that you sent is in. Um, we will be forwarding that to the highway superintendent because he is the person who has the mandate for road signage. Also, to have to get run by our attorney uh, for appropriateness. So um, I would anticipate right after budget, we'll be able to get onto that. Okay. But in the interim, not to say that the highway super can't start reviewing the packet. Right. And so in terms of like, keeping track do you you do you mind us just coming here and asking and say hey no that's happening? fine and if you want to send it, uh, an email directly to my email or to the clerk and have her disperse it amongst the board that that would be appropriate also okay cool Has things subsided at all? 
it's been it's been a, a, a big improvement. Of course, it's it's we're in a kind of a down season, but but what we are you know positive about is we're, we're seeing just hikers, which we welcome, obviously. And uh, and well, and the other thing is that uh, um, I think you saw in the paper that uh, Audubon has worked with Boscobel, so now there's like three times as much parking over there. Plus, you can reserve it, which is really great for people coming from a long distance away. Because I know a lot of the complaints I heard from from folks was, uh, you know, gee, I, I came all the way here from X Y Z, and I really understand that. <laughs> you come up there with your family, and there's no place. But now, at least for uh, the way the arrangement is right now, um, there's a you can reserve parking over there. Right, so it's, yeah, it's it seems to have, and it's much a lot more. Right, so. and the genesis of a good thing here. Right, and you get a nice extra half mile hike, so that's cool. Yes. Um, the other thing, real quickly, was um, we talked about, um, all right, we'd asked about signage and, and well, enforcement on a private road. And uh, Mr. Shea, you had said that as long as the signage is explicit, uh, that there will be ticketed and towing and that sort of thing. Um, your understanding, or the understanding was that, that it was enforceable. And one of the comments you made was, Maybe our attorney needs to call a sheriff. So my question is, how can we hear that directly? Can are we? Is it okay for uh, us to talk to ask the question of the attorney, or does it need to? What's the proper channel for that? Because before we go out and buy the signs, we'd like to make sure that a they're the correct signs, and b that once we put them up, right. it really and truly is enforceable. I'll speak with the attorney tomorrow. I have a call until then. I'll get back to you. Okay. So if you want to send a follow-up to the clerk tomorrow, Absolutely. that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Terrific. Appreciate it. Good evening, everybody. I, I needed to bring a couple of hats with me because I'm speaking for several different organizations this evening. So my first hat is the Shakespeare Festival. And I, as a member of the board of directors of the Shakespeare Festival, uh, it is my pleasure to be in support of this uh, proposal. I can tell you that all the members of the board, while they can't, couldn't all be here, and they didn't elect me as their representative, but I came, uh, and this group is 100% involved in the funding of this project. They've, uh, the whole board has made a commitment to this project. Uh, and somebody will have the latest total for the board commitment. But as I recall, it's something in the five, six, seven, eight. Let's say five million. The board is, uh, has made a substantial financial commitment to this process. So, and whatever it takes for the board to be supportive of it, uh, however many meetings it takes, we will, we will be right here. This is a great group, and we're delighted to be in support of them. So, uh, now this is the Cold Spring Chamber of Commerce. Um, of which I am a board member, and I just wanted to, we wanted to make the suggestion to the board that if in fact you wanted the chamber to be a coordinating agent or helpful in the, I know you've, I've, we've heard you talk about trying to upgrade technology infrastructure in town, talking about various levels of cell service and internet service and otherwise, and if in fact there's a role for the Chamber of Commerce to get involved with you all in meeting with various elected officials and being supportive, I mean there are a lot of business people in Cold Spring who are anxious to pursue, particularly from the point of view of spotty internet, uh, and if in fact you need us to be helpful to you we'd be the chamber is at your disposal and we've talked about being useful so we just need you to ask us is there anything planned are you are you working on anything just i know you'd had some conversations with sandy galef and maybe nancy's been working on it and i just want to we want to be helpful all right yeah well i mean Nancy, do you want to comment on that Just to update everybody, you know, we've been getting lots of complaints, people who run their businesses from home now, um, and just the impact of COVID on the internet and the service is just 
awful. Lots of complaints about um, increasing their rates just randomly. And also I had one complaint about a dropped dispatch call, which was very concerning to me. So I've been trying to get Putnam Bureau um, interested in that and working on that. But Richard and I did meet with government relations at Optimum and was an eye-opening conversation and him, you know, with heartfelt concern for what's happening, but us coming to an understanding of what they're faced with, um, turnover in staff, COVID, and also building their infrastructure. And basically what we're going to see is um, it's going to be a long way off for us. They're, they're working on it now on Long Island, Westchester's next, and then we're next for, um, is it Hi, what is it Fiber called? Optics. Fiber optics. Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm not tech savvy, but yeah. So it's coming down the pike, and um, we would really welcome your help. And I'll fill you in on any other conversations we have with them. Okay. <laughs> I, I felt like it was a really honest meeting. Um, the representative from the government services uh, department was open to trying to help. Also, just saying, look, if you have specific specific instances and residences that are facing chronic problems send them his you know send them the, the contact for that and they'll address it they'll make sure someone reaches out to them they are pretty responsive in that way uh, i think there's some frustration um and, and this includes myself you know with the tech gap sometimes if you weren't born into it you're not as savvy and it it sometimes they find things that are pretty simple to remedy um other things um, not so much, but I understand the service. And look, and when you're also dropping calls in the middle of the village of Cold Spring, that indicates something. And, and you know, it's this push and pull between people don't want cell towers, they want good service, they don't want, you know, a, a lot of things as far as the wires. And, you know, there's a lot of things to clean up for uh, Verizon. We know that, but uh, we're working on it. We're definitely working on it. Uh, last item is the uh, comprehensive plan, uh, and um, I just want you to know that we are the comprehensive plan update committee, of which I am the coordinator. Uh, we have pretty much finished our work. We're trying to as uh, assess what additional information we learned in the survey that we just did. Uh, that survey was not intended as a fill, as, as covering all the ground. It was intended as a fill in the gap survey, things that we weren't able to have uh, had any good insights on to date. But we've, assuming that we get this, uh, this information processed in the next month, we'd like to think, in fact, I'm dedicated to however you want it to be delivered to you. I think we are, we are in a position to deliver you a draft of a new comprehensive plan uh, as early as your December meeting. Now, if in fact you say, whoa, we've got too many things going and, you know, hold off until the new year. But we just, we don't really know what happens next. All we know is that we're meant to get something to you. Uh, we uh, have a draft. Uh, we're finishing the draft up and we're in a position to give it to you if you'll guide me as to when and how is best to do that. I, th I think it would be great to get on the December agenda. The sooner the better. And I mean... That, okay. Then we get it in our hands, we can review it as a board, you know, formulate questions and have the back and forth. Good. Well, I think our, our group is feeling like, you know, we've spent enough time getting it this far. Of course, there's going to be a lot of things we forgot about or didn't cover or haven't yet covered. And we're going to hear a lot from the community. But we figured this is a pretty good update on where we were uh, back in 2006. Uh, there'll be a lot in that in the document that you've already seen before because it's still relevant from 2006. But there's a lot in there about uh, about climate and about the leadership that you all have taken in uh, greenhouse gas emission. Uh, it, it's well, Thank you for your guidance. We'll uh, we'll get it on the agenda, and we'll bring. What should, is this something that I just you know drop on your desk there, or uh, what's the best way to do it? Get the town clerk. Okay, Maybe good. She'll make sure that we get it, but also, you know, it would be good to have a brief presentation at the monthly meeting in December because then also it goes out to the community. Yeah. Okay. Great. Gosh, thank you. And our, our hats are off to you yeah. <laughs> for being able to hold this group together for this long.
Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Legislator Montgomery for putting together that meeting regarding technology and Optimum. Um, it's not easy to pull these things together right now. I know that. And also, I thought it was a really, really worthwhile meeting. So a lot of times you come out of those things, you're like, well, what just happened? But I felt like we got a good response. Yeah, and maybe we can get something up on the website if you want to coordinate with Tara so people can direct those complaints. That would be great. Thank you. Um, anyone else? So I'm, I'm Crystal Ford. I wasn't originally going to say anything, but I, I feel like I have to um, say how sad that I am about not being able to access Constitution Marsh. I feel like there's only three days that you could park at Boscobel. It's only from Monday on the week. It's like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday or something. I'm not going to walk on Route 9D with my children to go to, I live like two minutes from Constitution Marsh, but I have to go, you know, across Route 9 and Indian Brook. I'm not going to walk that. It's, it, I just feel very sad that we, ha we have to find a way that the community can access the parking. Maybe it's a Monday to Thursday, the parking is available for the community members and then shut it down for the weekend because you know it's like it's a real loss for us i was very sad um to just realize like that we're shut out from that um so i know the uh, the other solution i think is like we need to have our own version of the trolley whatever they're offering that putnam thing that is like that doesn't work we need to have maybe something where we can park at the cold spring train and uh, train station and bring the hikers to the spot so we can alleviate this parking pressure that seems to be such a problem. Um, I know that's like long-term planning, but anyways, I just, I, it's, it would be really nice if we could figure out a way to like still have it available to the community. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, we're always open to suggestions if you want to put something in writing and get it to us. Um, people need to understand though that became an untenable situation there. And it was, uh, you know, health and safety issue where we had the road entirely blocked, people not being able to get to their own homes, ambulances, fire trucks, emergency service vehicles not being able to get in the road, towing people away, having, you know, only to come back and have someone parked in the spot where you towed a car from. It was impossible. And the residents are our concern. And we love Constitution Marsh, but our number one concern is the residents of the area who have an expe expectation of being able to enjoy a residential quality of life, which they were not at all. Um, and, and just to make sure I, I'm not mistaken, you can't park further down Indian Brook as it meets 9D, right? That's not a parking spot? There's no parking okay. on that that's, road from yeah. stem to stern. That's, that's what I was, because yeah, I was like, you just, can't really park anywhere. And... Unfortunately, it was abused and got way out of control, okay. and that's why we took the action we did. Because I know. The, the, I we know. were forced to, literally. I, I mean, know. It's, and I'm sure if you reached out to Scott, you could come to some accommodation with him. I'm sure he's, you know, he's completely amenable to working with locals. Yeah. Um, and we're not saying that, you know, somebody can't go down there with a bus, drop some people off, turn around and go park somewhere else. But it's, uh, we haven't come up with a solution. We, I know. I keep trying to think of one of myself. Yeah, we I tried. <laughs> we tried. We tried to you know, limit the parking at the old area, but it just got so abused. And literally people who were parking were being blocked in by other people who were parking. And then the garbage that was associated with it and the real lack of respect for the area, it was just suffering. It, it needs a break. And I think the message has gotten out now that, you know, it's not a free for all anymore. Yeah. So, but I, I, absolutely, if you want to submit something to the board, we would love to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, my name's Ellen Cadwallader, and I, um, uh, one of the residents there at Round Indian Brook, and uh, that. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there going to be a way where we all can get together? We talked about some workshops of coordinating, um, you know, the city, the, any of the state people, any of the people to talk about 
maybe long-term possibilities about parking areas, walking areas, you know, trolleys, whatever, as solutions um, for the area? Are there any, is there a way to um, organizing workshops, kind of thing? You brought that up, but is there a way yeah, of- Absolutely. How do, we go, how do we go about discussing, you, organizing that request, kind of a thing? Request to get on an agenda for a Wednesday workshop with the clerk and we'll put you on. Okay, okay. Okay, good. That's, yeah, because we're all looking for like some real solutions <laughs> so people can enjoy it and, you yes. know, yeah, but it's not a problem and, you know, everybody's just angry. <laughs> you know? Well, so. people get angry and no, that, but, doesn't, but, that but, doesn't generate solutions. <laughs> but some real solutions for the walking places. I mean, I think the whole Shakespeare thing is fabulous. It's going to be for the area, but these are also some long-term things to right make the whole area accessible for people, you know, right. and uh, so, anyway, so I just... Okay, so request things for workshop. Okay. Yeah, I, I think ultimately having some sort of pedestrian friendly sidewalk from the village all the way to Indybrook Road is, you know, something that should be explored, but that requires a lot of Everybody. work with, with DOT. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, the more pedestrian friendly the area, the better it is. Yeah. You know, and, and being that the farm market is at Boscobel and people want to get to Indybrook Road, and there is no parking, ultimately it needs to be a pedestrian friendly solution. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so just request a, a workshop kind of thing. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, thank you. One last call. <laughs> I think we've touched on everyone in the room. It's like a Norman Rockwell meeting. <laughs> um, anything from the board? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Vacancies, Board of Assessment Review, we have one vacancy for anyone who would like to get on the BAR. It's not a big commitment, but it is an important job. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nat, you know, you could wear another hat and get on the BAR. Yeah. Cemetery committee? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Approval of vouchers, general. So. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Highway? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. I vote aye. Continental Village Park District? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. I vote aye. Continental Village Water District? So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And I vote aye. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Adjourned.